why don't we start with you, Stephen Arnold, just give us a one minute snapshot of your brilliant career to, to date in, in relation to what you know about de-anonymizing. De what led you to being the guru for deep web, uh, dark web de-anonymizing? What's the past that led to today? My name's Stephen E. Arnold, and I started my career at Halliburton Nuclear and then worked at Booz Allen and Hamilton for many years. For the past four years, I've been uh, lecturing and training law enforcement and intelligence professionals in a wide range of tools and tactics related to human trafficking, uh, financial crime, and related subjects. That's wonderful, Steve. Now, based on your 40 years of history in the technology arena, which I might point out included writing the Google Trilogy, one of the greatest series mankind has ever had in its hands. Um, what technology focus do you think would be useful for human trafficking, child sex abuse, and related crimes? Well, I think the opportunity is to look beyond the vendors who capture the majority of contracts in the U.S., the U.K., Canada, and Western Europe. A new line of solutions is available, and these need to be brought into the task at hand. So what I hear you saying is <clears throat> the people who have the most to gain from stopping child trafficking and human trafficking are not paying attention to emerging technologies because they're not being offered by U.S. and U.K. providers. I think that the challenge is for administrators to look beyond what's comfortable and push themselves to identify new methods and the new vendors who are offering solutions that provide a quicker, more cost-effective way to track down bad actors. All right, let's say that you're in charge of the uh, Judicial Commission's uh, next generation system. What kind of architecture would you create uh, with the funding that would be made available to you in order to do all of this? I think that the opportunity today is to combine cloud-based solutions with special purpose tools located on premises so that they are indeed secure. Across both of these types of technology delivery systems, the effort has to go into one or two click access to tools that answer questions of investigators who are working under a crushing caseload and with very little time. So I think that the opportunity is to combine cloud, on-premises, and next generation vendors. What I hear you saying as an end user is that the average investigator doesn't know how to go find the data in a very anonymized system and they don't have easy access to the tools with which to do that and you want to create one and two click solutions that give them access to data and access to tools without their having to understand all of that. Absolutely. But the important thing is that this implementation has to get around the two major hurdles intelligence and law enforcement professionals face every day. The first hurdle is getting trained, and the second hurdle is retraining to keep up with the changes in the systems. And unless we come up with easy to use, ready to roll, one click access, to functionality that will identify a bad actor, de-anonymize a particular Bitcoin transaction, we're not going to make any progress against the increasing rise in a wide range of crimes, including human trafficking. It sounds to me, based on my experience, I was a founding member of the Advanced Information Processing and Analysis Steering Group for the U.S. Secret Intelligence Community, and I found that 80% of the functionality of any IT system was never used for lack of training. It sounds like you're suggesting not only a common system that can be taught to Interpol and Europol and the FBI and other national 
police agencies, but perhaps even an international academy training program that creates a service of common concern as a nonprofit or federally funded research uh, endeavor. Is this something where we could create something that could be made available to anybody who shares their data so that we can do pedophilia investigations? Well, my view is that the only way to deal with the digital enabling of bad actors is to create the equivalent of an easy to use, self-serve, one-stop one solution that can be used by a cross country team of investigators or within a single unit in a particular country. And the idea is that instead of waiting one or two years for a procurement cycle to deliver the next generation tool, the team simply can log in, browse what's available from the menu, and make use of that tool immediately. And if it's necessary to work on premises, then download the components that are required and the team can use them. This is all very, very promising. Uh, now, people are talking about open source versus proprietary. And you know that I started the open source intelligence discipline and I believe in open source everything engineering. So please tell us about your view on open source versus proprietary commercial solutions in this particular de-anonymizing space. I don't think lines have to be drawn. Today, one can download products from a company like Visalo, which essentially offers an open source alternative to Palantir. On the other hand, for very specific functions, like the de-anonymization of one of the more than 1,200 different digital currencies, we can turn to tools from companies like Elliptic. Now, open source versus proprietary? No. What do we need to use to shut down the bad actors? And that's the guideline that I follow. I think that's absolutely brilliant. You're the only person I know who crosses all boundaries. Are there any centers of excellence that you would rely on to help law enforcement and governments identify specifics to mix and match? I would like to tell you that there is a model in place and working, but in a series of lectures that I've given to one of the enforcement branches of the US government, when I raised this idea of a cloud-based toolkit available to investigators, regardless of the level of law enforcement, it was a new idea. And so I believe that while there are glimmers of this beginning to appear in Swedish intelligence and elsewhere, a cross-national, cross discipline approach is still not active and there's a tremendous opportunity to take advantage of the newer technologies and crack this training problem so officers and investigators can take action immediately and not run into roadblocks. I'm very excited by what you're saying because what it makes clear is that the International Tribunal for Natural Justice and the Judicial Commission could actually play a seed crystal role in developing this model and then making it available to, to law enforcement and others. So let me ask you my final question and then you'll have an opportunity to add any other thoughts. Uh, what causes the gap between what's new and, uh, and what works and the cycle of using products that are five, 10 and 20 years old? That seems to be a recurring problem in the US government, which some have characterized as 1950s mindsets using 1970s technology. I think you're correct. The experience I've had uh, working in the federal government is that uh, the procurement process itself has an internal momentum that is extremely difficult to change. Companies like Booz Allen have an ability to capture major multi-year, multi-billion dollar projects. And as a result, new uh, approaches, new vendors 
have a very difficult time getting through the established procurement process. And I've seen the same problem in Japan, in France, in the UK, and in other countries. The solution is to focus on procurement and encourage the administrative people to look at a demonstration system or have access to an architecture document that shows them that there are vendors and there are new approaches to use. Without that education and making it easy, we're going to have the same group of vendors providing the same type of solutions. What I hear you saying is that the people in government who are making decisions about procurement are thinking too much about their second career. Absolutely. They're playing nice. They don't want to offend the established major uh, providers of big solutions. So it does sound like there needs to be some kind of Trumpian um, cutoff where people who are in government making decisions about procurement cannot aspire to work for the people who they are benefiting with their procurement decisions. Would you agree that's one small fix? I agree that changes are required. It is okay. going to be very difficult to prevent a person like myself who worked for major government contractors like Halliburton and Booz Allen from not being approached by industry to get insights and some idea of what the procedures and the methods are. I think the important thing is that whatever appointments in the revolving doors between government and commercial work, regardless of country, is that that has to be monitored by an entity that is not tied to a single yes. goal or objective. There needs to be an oversight or watchdog mechanism put in place to highlight some of the more uh, problematic tie-ups. That's brilliant. And I can now see a role for the INTJ as a seed crystal to present a, a, uh, a model for people to follow. We have not talked about the dark web, which is one of your strengths. And we have not talked about the degree to which most human smuggling and uh, money laundering and other related crimes are hidden within the dark web. Would you like to end with just your overview of the dark web, its relationship to the open web, and where you think things are going in the next few years in terms of law enforcement being able to access and make sense of the dark web versus criminals being able to completely hide their tracks in encrypted communications and other uh, means? Well, I think that the phrase dark web and hidden web does not really explain what's happening. Let me make it clearer and simpler. When censorship goes into action, such as killing off conduits like Facebook for a hate group, those individuals want to communicate and they are going to find technology savvy people who share their beliefs and they are going to use network technology to create encrypted and undetectable channels of communication. And whether it is putting child pornography inside of a text document or whether it is hiding coded messages inside of a picture of a vacation spot in the French Riviera, those conduits will be expanded and enhanced. And law enforcement is not going to have a fat sitting duck to look at like the dark web or I2P encrypted chat. So as censorship becomes more common, the pace of innovation in hiding and obfuscating the actions and activities of bad actors is going to become a hotbed of innovation. And for law enforcement and intelligence professionals, that is a problem.
the power behind the ITNJ. Add your voice. Sign the treaty.